So, with Jeremy and Lucas in an alternate dimension, how are we supposed to open the show? I suggest 42. Wait, what? Jess, has anyone really been far even as decided to use even go want to do look more like? So 42. <laughs> what does that even mean? Well, it means you asked a complicated question that gets a simple answer. Or, this is Nerdcast. To the back. To the, to the Batmobile. Let's go. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. So in order to find our show's plot, our writer has taken off to explore known universes with a man in a blue phone box. I hope the actor will be okay. Well, he'll be fine. He took a towel with him. And because Mitch makes absolutely no sense, this is News and Views. After reviewing Don't Starve last week, I thought I was off survival games for a while. Like a long while. I'd had enough frustration disguised as fun, so understand that I was jaded going into Rust. For so, so many reasons. My biggest concern was that I was paying for a game that was in its alpha state. For those of you just learning this gaming thing, that puts it at about a year away from full release. I just bought someone's incomplete demo. But it must be Christmas, because that demo turned out to be a bear smacking hut build in paradise. Rust takes place somewhere that looks like low res Skyrim. You get your rock and you smack things until you die. It's not that you're supposed to die, you just will. Rust comes with no conveyance or tutorial, so your early hours will be spent learning how to do things that real-life children can do by accident. How do you cook things? Just drop them onto the fire. Oh no, that just drops them onto the ground. Jess, I can't access the fire. Oh my god, we're going to die. And we did die. We died so many times. But once we got past the learning curve, we found that Rust had so much to offer. Rust's biggest selling point is its sense of community. Since players can kill players and loot everything. And since death on its own can mean losing hours of progress, players quickly and organically band together. Jess and I formed a town with a half dozen other players and rudimentary laws. Our laws state that when someone kills another player, we in turn kill that player because justice is forged in irony. While some other players formed roving bands of bandit jerk faces who kill you and you can literally watch hours of your life disappear to gunshot wounds. Yes, there's guns. See, just because you start out butt naked smashing things with rocks doesn't mean you aren't a sophisticated human being. Know what else is in this game? Zombies and heavily irradiated towns, which means this game is probably taking place in some kind of alternate reality Chernobyl or yet another zompocalypse. What I like best about Rust is that it's cruel yet fair. The rules are the same for everybody. Same building rules, same upgrades from blueprints. Given enough time and resources, a player can outthink any other player and rob them. For example, I built a massive fortress thought I'd secured it and left the server. But when I came back after a few hours, I'd found that someone had built a long ramp up to my windows, took all of the stuff that not only me, but my other fellow citizens had collected and stored, including shotguns and weapon mods, and it was just gone. And I was mad. But once I'd simmered down, I'd also taken aback because no other game has ever been quite this organic. That guy got my stuff, sure. But now he has to defend everything he has from the next guy who's going to kill him. It's cruel at the time, but nothing I could have done to someone else, and so the circle of life continues. Simba! So, Rust in its alpha stage is of course incomplete, but it's still worth checking out. So far it's using the best ideas survival games have to offer, and it's shaping up to be something that goes beyond its genre. With a proper tutorial and some more content, this game is golden. Just try not to get too invested in it. You'll lose a lot of sleep that way. So hey guys, do you remember that show about Hannibal Lecter? What was that name again? Hannibal. No, the name of the show. Hannibal. Oh yeah, that was it. Yes, all of Hannibal's first season is available on Amazon Instant Streaming, but only if you have Prime. You see, 
The second season is premiering on February 28th, so you have plenty of time to catch up. And while we're talking about Amazon, why do they have to jump on every bandwagon ever, no matter how small, even if the product isn't doing well? But for some reason, they apparently just don't care how poorly something is doing. They're gonna waste money trying to beat it anyways because they just have to be number one. Amazon is moving forward with their rumored less than the cost of your college textbooks, Android-based console. From what we know, it basically sounds like a more expensive version of the Ouya, which is still not doing well. And now more from the rumor mill. PlayStation rumors, woohoo! The Last of Us might be getting a sequel, but don't get your hopes up. It's too soon and the PS4 might be getting original PlayStation and PS2 emulators first, but again, nothing has been confirmed. Remember, these are rumors and nothing is official. So if you just bought a PS4, based on these rumors, you're stupid. He's right, you know. You should have bought one a long time ago. Like, when you heard it existed a long time ago. Like, how long Dungeons & Dragons has been around a long time ago. Fun fact of the day, D&D is now 40. How old that must make your parents feel. Just don't tell us how old Pokemon is. No one needs to hear that. Have you heard of Robotoki? No? Well, it's a company led by Robert Bowling, a former Infinity Ward creative strategist. While yes, they do make games, they also plan to make videos. And I'm not just talking about the promos. Yep, from Call of Duty to movies, turns out you can move up in the world. That's so rude, Jess. Somewhere, some Call of Duty bro is cursing your name. I was just saying that you don't have to stay working on Call of Duty, and you can increase the genres you work on. Anyway, in case you heard about Nintendo putting games on mobile devices, it's all a lie. Oh no. The quote was taken out of context, and essentially they will use mobile devices to promote games, but to not actually put any on them. And if you haven't heard, sorry for getting your hopes up for a whole second before I told you that it was all a lie. Oh, well, moving on. Hey, Mitch. Yeah. I got some news for you. Yeah. Final Fantasy XIV has a release date for the PS4. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my Wait, 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 wait. 14, not 15. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't care. Trolled you. Pretty much. But in case you do care, that date is April 14th. You can also pre-order a collector's edition that comes with a wind-up Moogle and a fat chocobo mount. No one cares, Jess. Unless I can have a chocobo in real life, no one cares. A chocobo? Please. Moogle's for the win. There will also be a beta test at the end of February, and if you for some reason have it for the PS3 when it is released, you can upgrade to the PS4 for free. So anyone who's been watching movies in the last year has noticed the rise of possession films. Invariably, these are if movies about how awful our lives would be if our bodies were filled with the manifestation of pure evil. The greatest of these movies so far is by and away The Conjuring. But The Conjuring came out last year, so here's Devil's Due. Devil's Due is a found footage movie about what would happen if the plot of Rosemary's Baby were superimposed onto paranormal activity. Or if you're too young for that reference, the world's most boring married couple go to South America and are impregnated with the devil. My biggest problem with possession films is how obviously they pander to America's religious right. It's not that I'm against religion, but possession movies carry an ominous threat that if you're not down with God, then you're going to be killed by ghosts. Devil's Due takes possession movies to their logical conclusion by skipping those weak sauce other demons and letting Big Red himself destroy the lives of the whitest couple in middle class America. Seriously, these people are awful to listen to. They're a miserable mix of cliched lines and dad jokes. I'm perfectly fine with Satan ruining their lives, because it's the most exciting their lives have ever been. Some people just go out in a blaze of glory. Hail Satan! Whoever chose to make this movie a found footage film is out and out an idiot. This is partially because the concept just does not work in this particular scenario. As an audience member, I don't know how I'm seeing the footage I'm seeing, because it's shot from multiple cameras owned by multiple characters in the movie universe. So unless they got together to form an apocalypse collage, the whole idea is a moot point. Due to its graphic nature, the Nerdcast Apocalypse Collage has been 
confiscated by the government. They did inform us, however, that it might be returned to us after they scrutinize it for accuracy. The other reason found footage doesn't work here is because there's never enough on screen to keep it interesting. I'm all for horror movies using a slow pace to build suspense, but Devil's Do is so slow that they have to keep throwing in pointless jump scares into the first half of the movie just to remind you you're watching something you paid money for, not some boring white couple's obnoxious home videos. They even resort to keeping the camera on the lead actress's TNA up until she starts showing, of course. Way to call pregnant women fat, movie. But for me, the standout element of this movie was the tinge of racism. I told you how these movies pander to a, let's call them a duck dynasty side of America. Well, here we have the tragic story of the whitest people ever. They go on their honeymoon to some South American country. A foreigner invites them to a secret party. The white people pass out, and then the wife wakes up pregnant with the Antichrist. At least when this happens in Europe, they're only tortured to death. I'm not saying that the movie's trying to be racist. I'm just saying that I've written a lot of college essays and I've gotten A's for ideas with much less supporting evidence. What else is awful about this thing? Well, the fake satanic symbols and bad Bible translations stand out. Oh, and the special effects look like they were ripped right out of an episode of Supernatural, which makes sense because this whole movie looks like it was made on a WB budget. Basically, all you need to know about Devil's Due is that it's a cash-in attempt, using a mishmash of two popular horror subgenres, and it's wholly irredeemable. If you're going to see it, I recommend doing what the couple behind me did and make out loudly. After all, you won't miss anything, and you'll be the only people in the theater. So, apparently the PS4 is more powerful. Microsoft is working on a patch for the Xbox One that will increase the graphical performance. However, it still won't be quite up to par with the PS4. And I have another graphics change for you. Remember the good old days when you helped Sly Cooper steal back the Thievius Raccoonus from Clockwork and Gang? Well now, Sly is getting a movie in 2016. Bentley and Murray will be joining him in all their 3D CG glory. I think I'd prefer to keep them in the cel-shaded 2D graphics of yore. Well, just try not to compare it to the games. They are, however, including Sucker Punch in the process, so I have hope. Oh, and the plot line sounds like a shortened version of the first game. Speaking of animated movies, Frozen is now the highest grossing original animated film, meaning someone knocked Finding Nemo from the top spot. Frozen grossed more by $8 million, at least domestically here in the U.S. Called it. No, Mitch, not this again. All right. We are not doing this again. All right. Truthfully, I thought it was going to be Finding Dory. I know, me too. What's up with that? Big news. Elder Scrolls Online will not require a PlayStation Plus subscription for PlayStation 4. I repeat, it will not require a PS Plus subscription. Why is this big news, you ask? Well, I'll tell you why it's a big deal. Before the PlayStation 4, you didn't need a subscription to play online for PlayStation. They snuck that little detail in during their E3 press conference. However, you still need to pay a subscription to Bethesda to play the game to begin with. PlayStation 4s will be playing on either European or North American servers, and these are different from the PC servers. Hopefully that means no long queues like you see during WoW expansion releases. Yes, I can beat the system! There is also a confirmed console beta, but we don't have details on that yet. So, everyone likes Apple. Quarter 1, 2014, which is actually October through December, saw record-breaking sales for both iPhones and iPads. Macs also went up, but iPod sales are going down, down, down. Seriously, like half every year. Those things are still around? Looks like it, but their competition, Google, isn't slowing down either. They sold Motorola to Lenovo for $3 billion, but not all of it. They get to keep most of Motorola's patents and the Advanced Technology Projects Division, basically their R&D. Google had originally purchased Motorola in 2011 for $12.5 billion. They also made a deal with Samsung to keep Android running more uniform and smooth. Maybe you can find out more by stopping in one of the new 60 Samsung stores in Europe. Not all of them are open now, but they will be over the next few months. Why does Europe get all the cool phone stuff first? Because you're too needy. 
Google isn't done yet. They're expanding Google Glass. Some prescription frames, sans the lenses, have been added as well as sunglasses for those who already have the glass. Basically, you can look like a dork while still being able to see. Just don't wear them to the movies. So if we're in an alternate universe, does that mean we have a different writer? Wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Are you broken again? No, I'm just not really able to compute such an unanswerable question until we get our writer back. It's kind of on break. Well, until he comes back and fixes the plot like a well-placed DC relaunch, let's do words with pictures. Nice reference. What a dull week for comic news. Ah. Yeah, I mean, there's rumors stirring about the X-Men movie producers looking to do a Gambit solo movie with Channing Tatum, which could be good, but I'm just not sure I can see Tan Tatum as Gambit. He's just not roguish enough. I've heard he can do a good Cajun accent, but I don't know. I feel like this is one of those good ideas, or possibly good ideas, that might go horribly wrong, but I'm enjoying this idea too much to care. Oh. On the subject of movies, while Thor The Dark World heavily improved over the first movie, the third might be even better than that. Famed X-Force writer Craig Kyle will be joining his frequent co-writer Chris Yost to script the as-of-yet-unnamed Thor sequel. Exciting. Okay, everybody. So if you're going to be in the general DC area for Valentine's Weekend, or as a lot of people call it, Singles Awareness Weekend, you've got this amazing opportunity to go to one of the greatest anime conventions on the East Coast, KatsuCon. And the dates for that are going to be February 14th through the 16th. Also in other anime news, the series Space Dandy that exploded on January 5th in the US is still doing pretty well. You can still catch it on Adult Swim as new episodes continue to premiere. Also, Strike Witches Volume 2, courtesy of Funimation, is being released on Blu-ray as well as Dragon Ball Z Season 2, and that's Episodes 40 through 74. However, watch out, a lot of sites are offering the Blu-ray collection at very low prices, but the shipping is where they're going to get you. World's Finest Annual Number 1. So, I was all set to hate this issue. The series tends to fall in my bottom three pretty consistently, and here we have an whole annual's worth, but, uh, ooh, wow. Wow, it was actually worse than you could imagine. No, no, I can imagine terrible, horrible things. That's my job as a writer. But my surprise came at how excellent this issue was. The art was consistent and really smooth for starters, but mainly the story was just actually interesting. The characters were entertaining in a way they haven't been since, I guess, the Zero issue, really. Because this issue was also set in the days when Power Girl and Huntress were still Supergirl and Robin back on Earth 2. It just seems like in the present, they're such dull, stock characters aimlessly wandering in search of plot and direction. But back in their Earth 2 days, they were young and experienced heroes with, with gusto under the watch of a different kind of Batman and Superman. This series needs more of this stuff. I gotta give this issue a 9 out of 10. Guardians of the Galaxy number 11. So last week, I told you all new X-Men was great at the jumping on point, and here we have the other half of the crossover with Guardians of the Galaxy. And guess what? I'm guessing it made really great toilet paper, didn't it? No, 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 no. This issue was basically the same thing for this series. Superb character work, excellent jumping on point, lively artwork, very, very entertaining, all you could ask for. I barely knew these guys, but suddenly I'm way on board to keep going with this series. And now I'm actually excited for the movie. Do yourself a favor and pick up this issue and last week's all new X-Men for The Trial of Jean Grey. 9.5 out of 10, Batman and Robin Annual number 2. While there's not currently a Robin in action, the Batman and series still ties his name back into the second annual. What follows is a touching look back that gives a great nod back to Damien, even though it focuses primarily on Dick Grayson. One of the things that stood out was the use of 16-year-old Grayson as Robin for the first time, as per the compressed timeline of the 52. But it actually made me more open to acceptance of this. It was a bit cathartic to see Batman nearly fire Grayson on his first outing just as easily as he once famously fired Stephanie Brown. Okay, Jeremy, you're just going to pick any old excuse to talk about Stephanie Brown, aren't you? You got a problem with that, microchip man? Anyways, the art was great. This should be a delightful treat for Dick Grayson fans. Maybe bring a tear to your eye with its Damien moments. 9.5 out of 10. Dead Boy Detectives number 2. I loved the first issue of this Sandman spinoff, but this second was just... 
I don't know. There were definitely some good parts, sure, and the art was still perfectly fitting, but the flow of this issue was such a mess. I could barely keep track of who was trying to do what and why, not to mention the constant jarring scene transitions. I'm not ready to give up on this series, but I'm not ready to totally recommend it either. An unfortunate 5 out of 10. X-Men Legacy number 23. The penultimate issue in the Legion Saga. This gets my cover of the week award hands down. The series has always been among the most unique mainstream comics. Even with a giant monster battle finale, it's closing out that way. Yes, there's crazy action, but everything's more about the layer underneath it. This comic isn't about punching everything. It's existential, romantic, and dysfunctional through to the end, and everyone should check this out. 9.5 out of 10. Lucas, maybe you can use this to find your humanity again, or, or your ESOL, or whatever. My top five for this week. Number five, All-Star Western number 27. Powerfully existential from a very unique perspective. Number four is Thor, God of Thunder, number 18. Thor reenacts Old Yeller, meets Fox and the Hound with a dragon. Funny and then poignant. East of West number nine comes in at three. Political reversals and all sorts of more sci-fi western awesomeness. Number two is Superior Spider-Man number 26. Excellent plot twists all around and an incredibly reasonable explanation for Peter Parker's forthcoming return, which is also hinting at its twist. And number one, Uncanny Avengers number 16. Just... Awesome. Bottom five, Damien, Son of Batman, number four. Not so much awful, it's just very disappointingly generic with no real conclusion of any kind. Dead Boy Detectives, number two, as I already said. Catwoman, number 27. Anosenti, enough said. Batman, The Dark Knight, number 27. An undeniably necessary and timely message, but just dull execution. And Uncanny X-Force, number 17. Strife, just isn't a good villain, and the whole story just kind of ends with no real consequences. If there is one thing we the geek are known for, it's the constant conviction and dedication to crying out for the exact same storylines that we've already seen before, just with a little different twist. Wait, wait a minute, I, uh, I'm torn on that actually. While Jeremy struggles with his own Catch-22, we're going to take a quick look at the series that just has truly cast a spell over viewers everywhere. Witchcraft works. The series follows the life of Takamiya Honoka. The average student who you're bound to see in about any series you pick up. Well, here's where things get tricky because enter Kagari Ayaka, basically the princess of the school. So, these two characters are sat next to each other by fate, and boom, suddenly out of nowhere, Takamiya basically now finds his life in danger. And wouldn't you know it, Kagari comes to his rescue, dressed as, well, a witch, because it turns out that she is, in fact, known as what's called a workshop witch. She then proceeds to place him under her protection, and from then on, from then on, there is this understanding that she will protect him from harm and other stock shenanigans that might ensue. Seen it. Stop it. Despite these outrageously generic outlines for the show's plot, popular anime streaming websites are blowing up with nothing but good vibes and reviews about the show. And it, well, to be honest, from the artwork and the fan reviews alone, it looks like it's actually worth checking out. If you check it out and you really enjoy it, you may want to try Maburuho, Maha Romantic, and especially Melancholy of Harui Suzumiya. I, I suddenly feel a little disturbed by this. Why? Well, it doesn't make any sense. Well, it is a thing. Well, yeah, but it, it's, it's a thing that doesn't make any sense. But you are a thing that doesn't make sense, which is why we need a writer to make things that make sense. What are we even talking about? Good, bad, random. In case you heard about Nintendo putting games on mobile devices, it's all a lie. Good. You don't have to carry that DS with you anymore, so you get more bag space and less devices to keep track of and or get stolen. Bad. Last time I checked, virtual buttons usually equals poor controlling. Random. 
What if this all concludes with Nintendo making a 3DS phone hybrid? The 3DSP would be sweet. Good. Nintendo will earn more revenue and keep them afloat so we can get a new Zelda game 10 years down the line. I'm pretty sure this is going to have a pretty limited market. Random. For this project to have any kind of success, we'd have to fight with the millions of apps and ROMs already out on the market for free. Good. There could be a relaunch of some classic games or remakes, kind of like the latest Link to the Past that was released for the 3DS. So let's look at it like this. You're going to have to rebuy all the same games you've already purchased before for your Wii, your DS, and your 64. Random. Oh, my game's not working. <laughs> You know, I can't help but notice all the sci-fi references we've made this episode. Well, yeah, maybe our writer really is a nerd. Or a nerdster. What is a nerdster? You're well, making up words. No, no, no. No, like Big Bang Theory, like nerdster material. What does Big Bang Theory have to do with being a nerdster? I'm glad you asked, Jess. Because on behalf of nerds everywhere and the people who watch trashy sitcoms, here comes a nerd rant. The Joker once famously said, if I'm going to have an origin story, I want it to be multiple choice. This was a beautiful way to avoid aggravating fans, myself included, who might have been unhappy with the proposed origin story for the clown prince of crime in Alan Moore's Killing Joke, an essential piece of Batman history. But while Joker specifically made the continuity of his own proposed origin murky, I've seen a few too many writers take the entire thing completely straight, and the story as a whole can't be ignored because it contains a character-changing moment where Barbara Gordon is shot through the spine and paralyzed from the waist down, forcing a retirement as Batgirl, leaning her towards the long tenure as the inspiring wheelchair-bound hero Oracle. But I'm here to talk about the Joker. The point of his plot in The Killing Joke is to prove that one bad day can turn anyone into someone like him, even Gotham's shining beacon of righteousness, Commissioner Gordon, Kidnapping him and sending him through a roller coaster ride filled with images of his own daughter, crippled, naked, and humiliated, still couldn't break the man. When Batman freed Gordon, he looked right into Batman's eyes and he told him, You take him down by the book. Joker loses, and his theory was disproven. So, why would an appropriate take from that story be to suggest that the Joker, the single most brilliantly insane criminal mastermind, could have possibly been a completely regular Joe down in his luck before his fall into a vat of chemicals. I just don't buy it. Struggling comedian with a pregnant wife and a dead-end job at a chemical plant takes a job with criminals to rob his place of employment for a one-time crime, and that turns him into the greatest comic book villain in history? No, no. While the falling into chemicals is absolutely canon, here are plenty of great ways that other writers have managed to warp this around into something far greater, better yet when the ambiguity is kept. Part of the specifically uncertain continuity series, Man Confidential, Lovers and Madman was a story that proposed a master criminal for hire, a specialist on elaborate crimes, bored with the ease at which his job comes to him, until he meets the Batman. Suddenly his life has meaning and purpose, and he begins going out of his way to engineer his crimes in such ways that he meets Batman again. But something's just off for him. When he falls into the vat, it unleashes his true inner self, freed from the trappings of social expectations. Better yet, the recent Zero Yark managed to completely retell the story while further establishing Joker's mastery and completely retaining his ambiguity. We have no idea when Red Hood 1 was replaced with the Joker or who he possibly could have been beforehand. His identity is a blank slate, and that's beautiful. But the key here is that the Joker was always who he was deep down inside. He was a sociopath lost in the trappings of normal life. He was still twisted, but he wasn't sure how to express it. When he fell into the vat, it was an awakening. It unlocked the Joker out of the shell of a man he was before. In a sense, it was almost a dark baptism where the Joker was born through a chemical cleansing of his empty humanity. Even the New 52 Suicide Squad supports this, with Harley recalling Joker forcing her through the same baptism to cement the unleashing of Harley Quinn from the trappings of Harleen Quinzel. Bottom line is this. 
ignore the normal guy origin for the Joker. It makes no sense. The Joker is the Joker through and through. No normal person can be transformed so drastically through the proposed scenario. The Joker's human identity doesn't matter, which is why his zero-year story of anonymity works so well. He was an empty shell of himself before he was fully realized in that fall, which also adds to his obsession with Batman, the man who essentially helped him find his true self. His twisted, dark chaos doings are almost a sign of gratitude to the dark knight of justice and order as the yang to Joker's chaos incarnate. Well, that was our show. I was hoping for a higher quality of writing this week. I was hoping for a plot twist, or, you know, even a plot. Hi, I'm the new AI, and I'm your new plot twist. You are Nurse Captain. How can I help you? How would you like that the show today? Oh, God. The show just got worse. Oh, my God, writer. What have you done? See you next week, fellow nerds. Oh. How is the Big Bang Theory nerdster? I'm glad you asked, Jess, because the behavior of it is gone. No laptop, come back. Some people just go out in a blaze of gory. <laughs> gory. <laughs> Way to call a pregnant woman fat, bitch. No, movie. Oh, movie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I saw the ending and ignored the rest of it. <laughs>